Welcome to the Enlighten Up podcast. I'm Lisa Watson and will be joined by my co-hosts Nicole Frolic and Brian Koenigberg. The Enlighten Up podcast is a weekly show that provides an unconventional and refreshing spin on spirituality, where three friends and weekly guests share informative, fun, and usually off-the-wall conversations. Unlike others, we provide fringe and skeptical viewpoints on all topics, because our experience has taught us that the echo chamber is a boring place from which to learn. So regardless of where you are in your spiritual journey, we can promise you, you're going to find a place to fit in here. So we invite you to grab a drink and listen in on our casual, entertaining, and hopefully enlightening conversation. And Enlighten Up is a self-funded podcast. So if you would like to help us to continue to be able to produce, enhance, and expand the show for our audience, then please send your support using the link in the show notes or go to our website, lightenup.us, and check out our merchandise shop where you can purchase merchandise that will allow you to express some spiritual humor. You may also show your support by leaving us a review on iTunes and following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Thank you all so much for listening and supporting us. And now let's jump right into the episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Enlighten Up podcast. We are back with you once again with Brian, Lisa, and myself. And today we have a new guest on the show. We are happy to have Mary Ducina, who was previously the radio host of Cosmic Conditions on the first psychic call-in show in the 80s in Tampa, Florida. She has been a mystic since she was five years old. She stared at the stars as a child and fell in love with nature. She was also born on Halloween night. She is a natural clairvoyant astrologer, herbalist, and holistic healer. You can also hear her uh, every uh, month on Lighting the Void with Joe Roop, who we've also had on our show, every month on the new moon. Mary, welcome to uh, the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm blessed as we all are, and I love the name of your podcast. I love Enlighten Up. Anything that uplifts is so important in these days and times. So I, what, a, what a great name. What a great oh, name. Thank you. Thank you. And it just so happens that you share the same birthday as Brian. Yay. Oh, Another yeah. Halloween-y. Yes, you do. I love that. I love that. Brian, did you forget your birthday? <laughs> no, I know my birthday. <laughs> He didn't hear that you said her birthday was on Halloween. Yeah, he did. Oh. You said we he, share it. That's ah. right. He's, he's being a true mystical Halloween Scorpio. He wants to be the raven on the branch, observing and listening and sensing and feeling. He's not going to jump in. He's an, he's, he's an observer right now. We, now, yeah. if I would have said, oh, your birthday's March 8th, then you could have said, did I forget my birthday? <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> oh well um it's a pleasure to have you on i've listened to your show on um lighting the void several times and Thank i you. just i love uh i love the interaction that you and joe have joe's wonderful we've had him he on is. before yeah we love him here and um you know i'm interested you you kind of at five years old became aware of your abilities what kind of happened there well it's it, the short form of the story is is believe it or not as gregarious as i can be which most scorpios aren't especially with the stellium in scorpio a bunch of stuff in scorpio i was always more comfortable outside in the mountains of tennessee and the great smoky mountains my grandmother you've heard me if you've heard me on joe's show mamaw as we affectionately call it myself was very holy spirit based i was always extremely comfortable with that holy ghost holy spirit vibration not, and this is not any disdain toward anything, but I was not as comfortable in the building of the church. I, although I had great times, I was more comfortable outside, under the stars, in nature, climbing the woods. It was just every, to me, home was nature because I guess I just figured, well, it's logical. I live on earth. This is my home. I don't think I knew that at five. I don't know what I knew at five. But one night I was laying outside on our carport with a bevy of dogs and we had five acres fenced in the woods behind us, and it had to be a summer night because I was laying with my back on the concrete. And I remember I went into type, a type of um, semi-sleep or semi-trance, although believe me, it, I remember the moment vividly today. I was very awake, but in a different kind of state of consciousness, which I didn't need to define then because it was a knowing. And I was looking at the stars and watching the different ones kind of twinkle with different colors. And I remember so poignantly feeling how do I get back home? That's home. This is okay. 
<laughs> but I'm not from here. How do I get back home? So my mother comes out looking for the rounding up the kids for the evening at nine or nine thirty, of course, because everything was fenced in. So we were pretty safe then. And she's like, what are you doing? I've been looking for you. What are you doing? And I said, I'm trying to figure out how to get back home. As children will just blurt out. Mm. And she's like, okay. She goes, this is your home. <laughs> right there's the front door to the house. Your dad's in there watching TV. Your brothers are in the other room. And this is your home. This is your home. And I'm like, no, I know I live here. I mean, home. It's kind of like <laughs> E.T. You know, I pointed up to the stars and she goes, oh, okay, honey, you must be tired. Come on to the house now. Just like that. And that's just as vivid for me today. So fast forward. And I studied a lot of Paramahansa Yogananda and certain scriptures of the Bible that were very metaphysical for me and, and didn't have a timeline or restriction of energies of healing or advancing one's consciousness and studied herbal remedies and all that. But then when I went on my own 25 year plus pilgrimage back into one side of my family into the First Nations people and the Native American fire ceremonies and traveled out west and, you know, went to Taos Pueblo and went to the Hopi Mesa and, and then, you know, in Florida for years was, was at the fire circle ceremonies at the, at the Saturday before the new moon in Dade city. When I actually, it all coalesced and came together when I was sitting outside and in Florida, all the tribes come in winter because it's the best place to do ceremony when everybody else is getting ice and snow, et cetera. And so there's like all kinds of different uh, indigenous tribes that come there and it was just for donations. So it's always very crowded. And I remember when I watched the one agent, the one assigned person that sits at the fire and beats the drum, which is representative of the heartbeat of the group, the heartbeat of great spirit, great mystery, I knew then this is my church. This is heaven and this is earth. So I never was drawn, although you have to learn it, I was never drawn to the technical, hard teaching aspects of astrology. For me, it was how can I bring the soul signature, how can I bring our star map into more of a down-to-earth way for people to be able to partake of the benefits that they've come in with for this incarnation. So I marvel still at technical astrologers because it's just like, oh, no, I'm bored. You know, God bless you. I can't do that. I, to me, it's got to be alive. I've got to journey with you to explain your Pluto or the dragon's head or what Venus is doing right now. It, to me, it's, it's a very viable frequency and if you tune in it's like picking up your your phone are you going to go to instagram are you going to go to facebook are you going to go to your emails are you going to text somebody that's the different planets that you're visiting and so when i do someone's astrological chart i do it in the in in a in tandem with the first nations medicine wheel that's the way i do it so your ascendant is east it's the eagle and it's the dawning of your life it's the opening of your portal so it's like that. I do astrology much in a more mystical sense rather than a technical sense. Or Although, again, I admire all those people that do it technically. Well, Not it, this mystic. Not this mystic. It sounds fascinating. I love that. And, of course, I, Lisa and I are huge fans of, of allowing that natural, mystical, intuitive nature to come forward in tandem with astrology. Yeah. It's Makes a language. It it's a star language. Yeah. Yeah, star language. Um, it, so your, I mean, well, there's a lot going on right now. We've, we've just worked, we're, we're recording this on the lion's gate portal closing today. The portal mm -hmm. closes. We've mm -hmm. got Uranus. This is going retrograde and Jupiter is going, going direct, going direct, which is a great thing. Do you want to yeah, take the arrows, us? The arrows are flying forward in Sagittarius and Jupiter is each planet has a kind of governorship. Over each one of our 12 months, 12 signs, 12 disciples, or, you know, it activates different aspects in our chart. And here's the neat thing, whether you're advanced, intermediate, or beginner when it comes to working with the stars. It's as if each of us live in a round house and each of us have 12 rooms. And so each one of these rooms is a different kind of portal or a sanctuary that has a different flavor. So like when a lot of planets are, are forming and zooming through the water sign of Cancer the Crab, you know, we need to nurture ourselves like at summer solstice going into the third week of July. It's a great time every year to start leaning your intentions toward, am I being able to receive? Am I giving all the time, giving of my, my skill sets, helping other people with my tools, but what am I doing to replenish my own self? And that's not just going and getting a pedicure. It has to do with how are you massaging your own soul? How are you 
taking time. It's like take a part a while and rest. How are you resting and nurturing and allowing others generosity and kindness and donations and tithes to flow back into your life? I've learned a long time ago that it's, it's equally important for us to feel good about receiving from another, allowing other people to give back to us, uh, be, being able to feel as good about receiving tithes and donations and accolades that not so ego-based, but about, wow, you really helped untwist some knots for me at a deep, deep soul, psychological core level. Thank you for getting me out of my twisted trauma. And so, you know, someone might just send you a $100 prepaid credit card in the mail with the receipt, like, hey, go bless yourself, go bless some animals, which is what I normally do with those tips is go out and help critters in the woods like Ellie May off the Hill, Beverly Hillbillies. So it's, it's about receiving. And so we've shifted into the Leo stellium now. And so although the lion's gate starts to ramp up once the sun gets into Leo and, and comes full on the infinity of 8-8, eight, eight, Leo rules the inner child and the heart where the sign before that cancer moon child rules our inner infant, the baby. There was a big difference between the infant that we all once were. When little babies are born, I mean, parents, someone has to help lift their heads. The neck has to be cradled. And if you left them alone, they would starve to death. They wouldn't be able to evacuate, uh, clean themselves, evacuate the bladder without it building up, et cetera, et cetera. They wouldn't be able to feed themselves because the umbilical cord has been severed. It's a new world. It's a new life. So each year, I like to take clients around the wheel of Maybe like for you, Nicole or Brian or, or Lisa, maybe each of you have the realm, the region, the zone, the house that has the zodiac sign of cancer involved with it. This has to do with you making sure your feelings aren't in a quagmire. How am I feeling? When you get to Leo, which is where we are now, it has to do with, does this make my heart light up? Does this make my heart shine? Leo is the eyes of the heart, like brave heart, heart of the sunrise. It's the eyes of the heart, how the heart wants to see it, wants to look at it. And too many people walk around caught up in the monkey mind. They, they, they give mind the control and it's constant chatter. And it's always doing a type of conflict, uh, blah, blah. You know, if you, if you say black, it says white. If you say up, it says down. If you say yes, it says why not? No. So we get caught up in limbo if we allow the mind to take to be the captain of our relationships with spirit. It needs to be the soul and our soul's strength to be the captain of this incarnation and this vision quest that we're on, even above the body. The soul, the captain, but the heart and the soul hang out together there at that heart chakra, going from the heart chakra up to the crown. And Leo reminds us your courage your ability to overcome anything is that you let your inner child walk with you because now you're the parent. Once there was a parent or there was a guardian that may or may not have done nice things and steered you in the right direction. We all met a lot of people that didn't get that. They just didn't get that. So, and it, it's a signature that rides with them with abandonment issues and rejection issues and bullying issues. And with all this internet, the political, the vitriol that's going on right now, I believe Leo is here in 2019 with all these Leo planets of Mars and Leo and Mercury returning there today and, and the new moon, the black moon with the with second new moon with the moon and sun in Leo and like Venus and Mars and Jupiter and in, in the fire sign of Sagittarius saying, stop, stop the madness. Just stop. You're disconnected. When you're disconnected, your heart light isn't lit up. It's almost like it's, it's entombed. It's almost as if it's just run into the shadows. And so internet trolls and the false bravery, it's real easy for someone to be brave on the internet and to render their, their opinion to treasures and the conspiracy theories and all of that. And it's very draining. It's very draining. So Leo is reminding us here in 2019. And as you were talking about today, as we go into the 14th, Venus is in a superior conjunction to the sun. Here's that technical stuff. And what it means is Venus is going to go to the heart of the sun. It's called Kazemi. And so here's, here's the, to me, here's the mystical aspect of it. Venus, Aphrodite, the, the Roman and Greek goddess of beauty, you know, uh, Botticelli's beautiful painting of her arriving on that shell 
and the foam of the sea with the cherubim, you know, giving her her robe, Venus is going to kiss the heart of the sun at exact degree at about 19 degrees. And anybody that's ever studied the tarot, the, the original major arcana of the tarot, 19 is the sun card. 19 is the sun card. They're coming together at 19 degrees of Leo. This is such an auspicious August. I mean, it really is auspicious August. And as we come to the end, the latter part of August, all this stuff that's vibrating in the heart's eyes are going to move into the harvest maiden of Virgo. So you think about the empress and the tarot card. You think about how she's able to, she has all the methodical technical ability of Virgo to learn how to till the soil, measure the rain. Is there enough sunlight? Plant the seeds a certain way, give enough space in between it. And then there's the growing season that we come through May, June, July, August, and then we get to Virgo in the third week of August by the sun's transit. And then it's about the things that actually arrive last after all that labor, after all that due diligence and work. It's the last thing that forms on the tree is the fruit or the nut. So there's the warming, the growing season, the ripening. There's cherry blossoms before there's a cherry. And so we're coming into the fruits of our labor, the fruits of our labor. And there's very auspicious things going on with Uranus and Taurus and Saturn and Pluto and Capricorn. Now we're shifting more from fire, which is aspirations, setting our intentions, inspirational uh, focus. Now it's going to start to shift in the third week of August. It's going to shift into the Virgo zone. And so we're going to have these Virgo planets kissing up with the material world. Uranus and Taurus. Taurus is a sign that says, I want to own it, touch it, feel it, smell it, consume it. Taurus is like, yeah, give me that wine. Give me that homemade wine. Let's have a really nice uh, meal with people that we trust and that we love to sit and just let our hair down with. You know, Taurus is like, give me the banquet anytime instead of the crowded mall. That's me. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so Virgo is about, and let's look at the nutrition and the holistic wellness of the fact that we are actually prioritizing time with the people in this lifetime that serve us well. It's good medicine. You know, I, I tend to look at things. I say to my clients all the time, you've heard the statement, laughter is the best medicine. So there's two types of energy signatures, the people, the scenarios, the situations, your own mood with yourself that you allow that either lift us up or drain us. So when we talk about energy vampires, we don't want to be one, nor that we need to give too much time to those type of of energy signatures from people. We can still be kind, but we don't, that that energy vampires are people that want to take from others and they don't want to do their own work. They want you to give them a physical healing, for example. Tell me the herbs, tell me the exercises, give me some chants of light language, but they don't really want to go in there and heal it at a soul level, at a psychological level, or stop the, the, the maddening rantings of their mind. You know, they don't want to, they don't want to confront their own negativity. And so of course what happens, the condition either shifts to another part of the body or it just returns. And that's why some people don't, they're not able to really maintain the healing. The energy vampires have moved into victim status rather than victory, and they enjoy the attention. Believe it or not, they enjoy the applause and the attention. Oh, you poor thing. You know, I had a guy actually say to me one time, it's not so bad I'm in a wheelchair. I get to go first in movies and restaurants and Disney World. And I said, what did you just say? (laughs) He said, well, you know, you've been to Disney. This is when I lived in Florida. You've been to Disney World. You have to wait in all those lines. He goes, I get to go first on the plane. And all that. I said, do you think you really want to give up that wheelchair now, that throne of yours that has wheels? I said, you've made that your, your, your chariot. You've made that your Merkaba. You've allowed yourself to be bound to the wheels of the chair. And he said, well, there are benefits to it. So he was okay with it. He really wasn't asking for a healing to get back up on his own two feet, so to speak. So you've got to look at people's intentions Instead of always taking it back to yourself that, wonder why that herb didn't work, or I really did, you know, send light language, or I really did, you know, work with that person's auric energies, or at the deep core levels, and or they're really in a great astrological cycle. Wonder why the the good luck buzz didn't come live and reside at the cellular level because they're in their own way. Yeah, I've been in my own way before. You know, I've been in my own way before. Until we have that reckoning, then at least at the at the very least, there's a delay factor. Well, you were speaking earlier about the the Leo energy and this idea of it, like, you know, what sings, what sings in your heart, what lights you up. And I know Lisa 
and I have both been kind of feeling that through the Leo season. Lisa just did her light language um, course uh, over the last weekend. And Lisa, you were just saying like, it was just so much fun. You were just having such a good time and dancing. Yeah, well, I have a lot of cancer in my chart. I'm mostly mm -hmm. cancer and then I have Leo. So this Lionsgate, I feel has been really powerful for me. There's been a lot of ups and downs. <laughs> yeah, and plus the eclipses. Let's not forget that the north and south node and the eclipses that we had. The first part of July was so intense. I mean, every cancer, a heavily uh, moon child chart or Capricorn chart, you know, because it wasn't just a solar eclipse in, in cancer moon child, not just uh, the full moon in Capricorn, but we have the north node, you know, bouncing around in, in moon child cancer. And we've got Pluto and Saturn opposing the cancer and, and laying down on the south node and the ancient astrologers called the north node the dragon's head so this is where the fire comes out and the dragon's looking to go and the way that the persian and aramaic astrologers address that and the phoenician astrologers is that the dragon's head is not so much the easy way out the dragon's head is the work that we signed on and co-contracted to come to do this lifetime and no matter how you preach or teach anybody, there's some people that really just have to have really hard physical type of lifetimes. They've not had that before, or they've come maybe from, from another walkabout to where everything was, you know, as they say, born with a golden spoon in their mouth. And so then they'll have laborious lifetimes. There's other people that choose to bow out of a lot of human species contact, and they may be a monk, or they may be a nun, or they may be one of the, uh, the deep bush aboriginal uh, people that doesn't want to have contact with humans and they have more of an isolated type of lifetime speaking with lisa uh, cancer the crab the crab walks sideways and backwards so it's natural for the cancerian area of our chart the moon child of our chart to kind of be in that hard shell be a little bit on the defensive because there's such a sweet soft uh, caravan of energies inside a turtle inside a crab you know a lot of people go for that soft gelatinous type of meat in turtle soup or in crab, you know, when they're making the inner part of the crab, but outside of the pinchers and the crab doesn't walk directly towards you. It'll pinch you and it'll try to go backwards and sideways on a situation. So Cancerian people, the cardinal signs of, of especially cancer and Libra, they'd really rather, really rather test the waters, so to speak, and let somebody else do the confronting and let somebody else step in for them. But they, they still have, very strong feelings and opinions about what's right or wrong in their life. And that's where they'll be stoic. But with her having the cancer, with you having the, the cancer and the Leo, the first part of July would have been what's so intense in your life that occurred 19 years ago. These eclipse patterns have not happened for 19 years. So that takes us back to the year 2000 going toward 2002. And when you get off this podcast or when you get done listening to this on YouTube or on the replay link, think back, kind of let that stew in your mind for a little while. What were the big changes? What did I guillotine? What did I enter into? What life shift was I excited about? What part of my inner child had to stretch beyond my psychological fractures or, or trembling traumas that once visited upon me, whether it was my school years or my home life or my first intimate partner or my first divorce or betrayal or rejection? That kind of stuff got stirred up at a deep subconscious level the last week of June this year and the first 10 days of July. Then after that full moon around mid-month in Capricorn, it's like we got our sea legs back and it's like the goat said, okay, I got to climb out of this. I mean, I've got to. I, I remember what happened to me 19 years ago. I, I have what I refer to as a nervous breakdown. Okay. January of 2000. So it was a pivotal year for me absolutely and my and what i'm saying to your audience and what i'm saying for myself as well as all of us i love the next year we're going into with the eclipses continuing in capricorn on the day after christmas and of course eclipses aren't just one day but on the 25th and 26th of this year it's going to be another eclipse in capricorn and then we move forth in 2020 the year of perfect vision 2020 is when the eye doctor says, oh, you have perfect vision, your vision's 2020. So we're gonna, all going to have to see in 2019 what it is that we're going to set forth as our new 
adherence to our vision quest in the year of 2020. This is a cumulative type of thing. And so on January uh, 10th of 2020, we're going to have the lunar eclipse at 20 degrees of Cancer. This, This solar eclipse that we had on July 2nd of 2019 formed a bridge to there. So we get a little hint at autumnal equinox this year when the sun and planets start to navigate into the sign of balance. Libra, okay, are you balanced? Are you giving too much? Are you taking too much? You know, bring yourself into balance. That's going to be key this year when we get to autumn equinox. When we get to that point, we've got to look at very quickly, very quickly, when we get to that third week in September, is there, and there may not be anything out of balance in your life. For most of us, there will be. You know, but what do I need to get more in balance with? I'm doing too much of that and not enough of that. And with Uranus and Taurus that Nicole brought up, we've also got to look at money is just a symbol. Back in the biblical times, it was called talents. Money has many different names all over the world, whether it's the dinar or it's the rupee or the dollar or or, or whatever. So talents, so skill sets, talents, barter even. So Uranus and Taurus going retrograde is going to have us look over the next few months at what holds value to me, what's on my priority list in 2019 going forth to 2020. We're going to lay down some new ground rules for what we'll invest in and what we decide to liquidate. And I'm also talking soul-wise, psychologically, uh, spiritual principles like Somebody may have been a nurse for 20 years and really done that and then moved into hospice work and say, you know what, I'm enough. I've given enough in the nursing service type of profession. I'm going to go do something else now. I'm going to go take Reiki and I'm going to teach yoga. I mean, she may de- he or she may decide I've given and given and done all the grunt work and been truly blessed and honored to serve people in their most critical times. But now I need to go on a vision quest that gives to me. It's going to be that it's going to be that stark. It's going to be that dynamic. There will be huge farewells and, and bountiful greetings that come into our life as we get to the December, January part, December of 2019 and January of 2020. And we've got that, we've got that Pluto Saturn thing coming up in the beginning of 2020 that hasn't happened for 34 years. And so that got activated too. So it's again, Astrology is wonderful. The language of stars is wonderful because orbits repeat and they all have different timelines. And 2019, subtract 18 and a half to 19 years, go back to 2000 toward the year of 2002. What were the key changes? How they affected you? What did you say goodbye to? What were you resistant to let go of? And what did you invite in? And some of it was probably very shocking. I mean, like, like Lisa was saying, when we get to a point to where our inner electricity is beginning to frazzle, when we start to have a stress or post-traumatic stress reaction or nervous breakdown, or it's just like, I, I'm out of this. I can't do this anymore. You'll hear, you'll hear people say things like, I can't live this way anymore. I'm not doing this. Because literally, your battery's getting drained and, and the charger's not in sight. Oh, gosh. I, I know a lot of my clients that are going through that right now. I, I, yeah. that, that is a common theme definitely going across the board and it's very prevalent. So uh, I can definitely see that, you know, it's interesting because Brian's our skeptic and Brian, well, Brian's Brian's actually very interested in tarot and that Mm -hmm. sort of things. I don't think he understood. At one time I was. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know if I still believe at all in, in what it is. It, it's a curiosity to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting because you were mentioning, Mary, about, you know, Leo being the inner child and all of that. And it's interesting because all three of us have kind of been nursing that a little bit through like what lights you up. And Brian probably mm-hmm. doesn't even realize it and, and probably won't give any credence to it either at the same time. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. But he... Um, he just started playing basketball during Leo season, which is something his inner child has been wanting to do for years. What this lights is, your heart up? What lights is, your heart up? Our holistic healing has to do with, like all, when I was a child, I was fascinated by 
Like I wasn't the little girl that was afraid of spiders and snakes. I'd argue with my dad, don't kill it, Mary, it's a snake. I don't care, it has a family somewhere. Just let's move away, just let the snake go out of the fence, it'll be okay. So I was really in tune with nature. And what I did in my 30s is I decided that was my inner child portal of strength. And I believe that over the last nine years, it's as if society has pulled us more into AI and techno addiction. I mean, I look at my, my friends and I'm like, you're drunk on your damn phone. You're addicted to that and you can't put it down. I get it for business. It's a great electronic uh, portable briefcase. I get it. But you got to put that down and, you know, you need to greet the moon and you need to greet the sun. We're disconnecting from nature and any elitist uh, type of, of governmental control that wants to work with fear porn or get people to be too addicted to the laptop or the Kindle or the smartphone or here, put the chip in your body. Go ahead and put the virtual reality behind your eye. You know, it's like we've got to disconnect from that and not lose the sovereignty of our soul, you know, our soul. So like, for example, if someone goes and plays basketball, there's like um, to the shamans laughing, really belly laughing hard is what they call shaking medicine. When we go out dancing, that shaking medicine. It's very similar. It's the light side of someone having an epileptic seizure and falling to the ground. This is when they're out of control and they're into shaking medicine, okay? There's an electrical, electromagnetic misfire, if you will, and certain stress, stressful conditions throughout incarnations or this lifetime may have become in a biological stress field to cause that. But the positive side of shaking medicine is playing basketball or frisbee or dancing or or or, or archery or just something that doesn't allow you to be tethered and leashed and listened to and watched by these smart devices. I, I really think this whole AI thing, this whole transhumanism thing is like, it, it's almost as if there's some type of a, some type of a process. It's like dumb down emotionally, put your eyes on your phone. Don't look around on the street. Don't be proactive about your safety. So when, when we're playing, you know, when we're actually going out and playing, it doesn't matter what our biological age is. We're engaging that infectious, wonder-filled, like a dog. Every, every morning when a dog wakes up, it's just like, yippee, it's time to go. Or, or a toddler, yes, you know, they, they may want to do something. That dog may have to go out to relieve itself. But it's like if you just hang out with dogs, they wake up happy. You know, usually young children, they wake up happy. People that have come out of pain from breaking a bone or, or being in a car accident, the smile cracks their face again when they wake up that day and it's not that horrific pain of that surgery or that accident. And I've always said to my clients, don't let pain. Don't let pain end up manifesting as your main teacher of this lifetime to bring up your gratitude factor because it's the little things. It's the little things that matter yeah. the most. You know, we're going to take our memories with us. It's not going to be all the stuff that we've accrued, all our little knickknacks, the fancy car we drive, how big our house is, how great our shoes and purses and wardrobe is. Uh, uh. No, it's going to be, are things right with your soul? Are you happy inside yourself? Does your heart light up when the new day begins? Can you get unknotted and untwisted from whatever's trying to haunt you in your mind or psychologically or some kind of shame, blame, guilt from the past? Work on that instead of just being so societal ruled by what's the current it thing you know what's the current financial status supposed to be because when someone people have worked when they've lost their house when they've had a surprise divorce or all the material assets went away their 401k t tank the, t the the financial crisis that hit the housing market in 2008 back when pluto went into capricorn there was a lot of rock and roll that went on with what people thought were secure the best security we've got is the currency, is the currency of our harmony. If you have harmony in your home, it doesn't matter how big your house is. If you have harmony with your children or you have, you're in sync with your mate, you can sit outside and have a sandwich and be happy because you've got a great life partner. And all that other stuff doesn't matter, and it's very temporal. And that's what Uranus and Taurus is teaching us, especially as we go into Virgo. So like like he's doing, he's engaging his inner child, his adult self is allowing the presence of the inner child that always lives within us, no matter what age we are, he's allowing that inner child to have its way, to have some play. There's an essence, there's a spirit to anger, 
there's an essence and there's an energy and there's a spirit to play. Just play. And so I think that that's a big gap right now with most of the age groups that I'm working with. It's, I say to them, what do you, what do you do for fun? What do you, what do you do for play? And, and, you know, computer gaming, it's not electronic. It's not electronic and that you're not just getting drunk until you pass out because to me that's avoidance and denial. So what do you do that's just pleasant and fun for you instead of just habitual or addictive? A lot of people can't answer that right now. They can't. You know, some people will say to me right away, oh, I love getting out of my boat or I, I go out among the trees and I go hiking. I'm like, good for you. Do more of that. It's Leo. Go do more of that. Make that the top three in the top three priorities in your top 10 list. You know, there was one of the talk hosts, David Letterman used to do a, a, a comedy, a parody about your top 10 list. And he made a whole comedy series out of it. I'm telling people now find the top three categories because they're going to shift of what is in your priority list right now. That's your currency. So that's either a debit or that's a credit. And if you don't have a sense of wonder and harmony and whether you're single or you're married or you're trying to work on a problem, find the spirit, find the spirit of harmony in play in working on that resolution. You got to first find it in yourself. You got to first find, you know what, if, if he or she wants to leave me, if they're just done with me, then perhaps, perhaps, We've gone as far as we can go and what the soul contract was for each other. It doesn't have to be a horrible thing. You know, who was it that told us that it absolutely had to be till death do us part? I mean, maybe that's a wonderful to be cherished accomplishment. But I got to tell you, when I look back on some of the people that ended up breaking up with me or I broke up with them, it wasn't, it was just like, I really was done with that. They really needed to be done with me because we both moved on to, to a higher frequency. So I don't want to carry that, how dare he, or, you know, he lied to me. Yeah, okay, maybe that's how spirit moved the, the chessboard of fate. Maybe that's how spirit moved the pieces, you know. Stop letting shame, blame, I'm right, they're wrong, rob you of your soul sweetness because it's dangerous. And I believe, like the Indians believe, and that's the way I was taught, I believe if your spirit, if your soul is sick, if it's fractured, if it's broken, that's where you've got to start whether it's reiki or light language or astrology or and and to brian's point about tarot and oracle i've always said because i started doing them when i was 14 years old this is just like little vignettes of a dream these cards don't have any power it's like a going to the grocery store let's see do i want to get captain crunch cereal do i want to get cheerios do i want to get granola what do i want to do and so the boxes are like tarot cards in the cereal section you know the you know the things you're looking at all the visuals are like what will you choose so I believe that, that oracle cards and, and tarot artistry is maybe just about helping you come into a, a bit more of an of a intuitive conversation with what's lurking in your subconscious. I believe it's good for that. But as far as it being a prognostication, ironclad tool, no, no. I believe it helps you see where you're kind of headed and where you may be stagnant on your path. And then it gives you options of like start the conversation of why you're there. And do you want to be there? Is this where you belong? So I agree with him. I mean, I agree with being an open-minded skeptic. <laughs> I mean, I really do. But that's kind of being a Scorpio. Skeptics don't bother me. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the tarot cards are really good, not at like giving you definitive answers, but like you said, opening up the conversation and exploring what's really going on. Well, like, like, like and, and the elements, you know, if you take it back to nature, you know, in the tarot, just like in regular playing cards, someone can break open a brand new deck of playing cards that they got at the casino and I'll say, pick one, pick one. And I can do an Oracle reading on if it's, if it's clubs, that's wands in the most tarot decks. If it's diamonds, that's pentacles. If it's hearts, that's cups. And we start dealing with, you know, everybody has emotions. Are they flowing or are they stagnant? You know, and if, and if they, so when you work with these, these symbols, you know, when you've got, air earth fire and water so when you whether you're going to the tarot or you're looking at how many fire signs do you have in your soul portrait your star map it's interesting and to me it's as fascinating when i look at someone's birth chart when i look at their star map maybe some people are absolutely lacking they have no water planets so they have no fire planets and the and the houses of the of the three fire houses are completely empty like they're really grouped up in a lot of earth and a lot of air 
I can assure you, and you won't find it in most astrology books, that when planets in a given year start to clump into those empty houses, like the, the area where there, if they don't have any water signs in their chart, when we start having Pisces season and Cancer season and Scorpio season, the three water signs, it'll be the most intense time of the year for them. So I like walking people around. I think the best way to understand your own chart is to learn, like if you have a Libra rising sign, that's the front door of your chart. That's east on your medicine wheel. So rather than just focusing on being a Scorpio or a Taurus or a Leo, start focusing on that was based off your time and location of birth. So start focusing on that ascending, that rising sign, and look at the turning of the wheel from that point. So your new year is like if you're a 10 degree Libra rising sign, every year the sun comes back to 10 degrees of Libra is the true, if you will, type of lion's gate but it's a libra's gate it's the it's the dawning of the true new year for that individual when the degree of the sun hits your rising sign if you're a three degree cancer rising that's june 25th if you're an eight degree scorpio sun that's halloween so when you look at the numbers and the elements and the timing and you just look at the the beauty of how nature gives herself to you saying you're really strong in in earth and you know you're you're a person that you need to be grounded you don't like frilly you don't like you like order you don't like confusion you like a plan you know that's the the earthy signs like that you know taurus and virgo and capricorn they kind of like to know what's next I and mean, they like a little bit of a plan and they relax when things are clean and in order so when i see a virgo that's really messy living in a pigsty and their car's filthy and all the wrappers and everything, and it's just like they're and they're, and they're they're disheveled, and their physical presence. And I'm like, you're a Virgo, and I see that their Mercury and their Mars or their Venus are in Virgo, and I realize they're so out of touch with themselves. Mm. You know, they they went askew of the element that's saying you got to get back to your foundation. You know, you got to get some order in your life. I'm not judging them. It's just that happens to be one of the signs of order. You know, it's Gemini can get away with spinning all over the place. Sagittarius can take every adventure it wants to and clean the truck later. But when it comes to you having a lot of Virgo in your chart and you don't have some kind of decorum and order and, 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 and fascination and enjoyment of things being hygienic and clean, something's gone awry. Oh, yeah. I know, I know plenty of Virgos who have everything in a very specific order. You don't come in and mess with their schedule. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. It's very much them. They don't, have, they don't lose their car keys either. A Virgo will say to me, I never lose my car keys. My car keys only get misplaced if somebody else touched them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Brian, did you, um, I know like Mary, we've got some, we've got a couple of audience questions for you, but um, Brian, since you're the skeptic and um, you know, be great for you to start off the questionnaire like did you have anything you wanted to ask mary like in terms of a, a reading anything you want to do brian i mean i don't i'm not going to label brian as just a skeptic he may be he's very open-minded yeah, he's yeah I, don't, very open I don't i just don't feel like he's i don't feel like he's such a lockdown person he feels very creative and effervescent to me he doesn't feel stuck he's not i would be curious on something very open-ended because I've got a lot of irons in the fire mm -hmm. and or seeds in the ground, I should call them. Okay. And I don't want to, I, I don't like the idea of hearing. Yeah. Like, you know, predictions for something specific. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it sets me up for, for failure. Um, yeah, I or think, expectation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, there, there's just, there are too many things that can, there are more possibilities beyond, you know, when you look at infinite possibilities and you're giving one, there are more that aren't going to come true than that are going to come true. Yeah. And I look at it as waves. I look at it as just like the tide, you know, there's a time of the day, evening or morning where it's high tide or low tide and such is the nature and the flow of water of, of the effluvia of Mother Earth, of the, of the salt waters, the womb waters of, of Mother Earth. So with you, when I just tune into your auric um, frequencies, I feel like that there's been, a, there's a crescendo, uh, so a nice high tide that's coming in from some applications of both release and then 
it's kind of looking at things in a completely different way that feels like it commenced somewhere around 2011, 2012. And then I feel like, you know, they are showing me a, an image. They're showing me the great North American eclipse that happened in the third week of August in 2017. Uh -huh. And I feel like that this was like, like heavenly, like I see like, uh, which is one of the ones I like, and the thrones and dominions and principalities of angels. My favorite are the seraphim. And I have a lot of images in my mind with them, the, the wings with eyes. And I'm seeing that there was a bountiful harvest, speaking about seeds in a garden, that started to really come into your life in that second and third week of August we in got 2017. Married. Oh, we got married okay. in the third week of August 2017. Okay, and I feel that, well, okay, then the coming together of your yin and your yang, the coming together and how that then seeded and sparked the, the bounty of both of your auras, you know, and what you'll do together as a team actually is the fuel of faith also individually for your skill sets of each of you. And so with you, Brian, I feel like that something's really coming together. And I do believe the fact that you got married in that third week of August at the great North American eclipse, for those of you who don't remember, it hadn't happened for 99 years. So none of us here on this phone tonight, we're not 99 years old. So we all lived through it for the first time. Talk about big star seeds, because that was right over the path of America. So I feel with you that I, I want to say that between um, September of this year, as I'm going into mid-February of 2020, I really feel this very nice, um, it's, it's an opportunity, I'm certain of that, but it's like something is expanding in a very auspicious, prosperous way. And what I keep hearing from one of my guides is, tell Brian it'll be delicious. Tell him it'll be absolutely <laughs> delicious. It's like I have to talk to you. It's like, it's like tell him he can taste it. Tell him it's going to be delicious. And I'm like, well, that's an odd way for me to say that to him. And I said, just say it. He'll get it. So I don't, I don't, question my I get guys. It. So it's like, I get it. Do you want to know why I get it? But I, I do get it. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I, I came up, I'm trying to open a restaurant. Ah, oh, that, that so will be successful. For, yeah. For, for it successful. to be delicious makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it does. Doesn't it? <laughs> it didn't make sense to me as my guy that kept, it's a male voice guy that was saying, just tell him, just tell him. Now I feel like there's also going to be a, a nice orbit like you have a different kind of um, knowledge or what's the word I'm looking for? You have a different kind of way of being able to micromanage this and an, your intuitiveness is going to serve you very well on who comes toward you to want to work in there or with you. It's like you have a very discerning eye, no matter how they dress, no matter what's on their resume, there's a certain, your intuition is going to serve you very well and, and your wife by your side too it's going to serve you very well with who you'll let come on board for you. It's going to be okay. almost like a ship and yeah. everybody has a very valuable, viable part of the team and there will be no mutiny or you're out. You're going to be real strong on that. That's the way he operates. So yep. that makes sense. Yep. It does. And he's not cruel. He's not mean. It's just like, you know, it's right. kind of like, I forget how that saying goes, but it's like business up front party in the back. Mm. Well, like if I had a mullet, that would be very intuitive, but I do not have a mullet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, but I just feel like that this is, again, and this is going to engage some ancient, if you'll just give me the benefit of taking it as a possibility, not as a, uh, your own truth, in the possibility realm of our soul having many, many lifetimes. One of the examples I've often used is if in one of my lifetimes, because they weren't all tragic and they weren't all fantastic. Some of them were just inane and, 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 and very, you know, basic lifetimes. I'm sure if we've had all, all kinds of soul walkabouts, but if in one of my lifetimes, I mastered really knowing how to bake really fabulous bread in France, then to me, it's logical that in this lifetime that Mary would have this autopilot uh, cellular ability to go in there and really make good bread because I once mastered it. Why wouldn't that travel along with me? I don't believe in just, if you will, generational curses. I believe that we also have generational blessings that when we meditate and we receive and allow and claim and bring it forth that Brian can say to all of my ancestors and to all of my 
generational elders, I give thanks for every aspect of how you served nutritional, delicious, comforting food in your culture, in the way that you did it, life force enhancements and all that. And I ask for all of that generational ancestral blessings to come forth in this restaurant. I don't see how that could hurt anything. It can only enhance. That sounds awesome. I like it. And with him being a Scorpio, when he puts his focus on something, it is alchemical. It's very alchemical. He's, you know, he, he'll have that traditional side to crunch the numbers, and this is what my food cost is, and this is what the linens are, and this is what I need to make per night, and mm-hmm. this is what I'm paying out. But then there's that other part of him, because that will just become very routine. Then there's the part of him that says, now, let's get busy with what makes this rock and roll unique fantastic, because his spirit self his higher self, the inner child, if you will, as well as the wizard within him, wants people to walk, walk in with and leave with a memorable healing experience. And believe me, it's very primal that can happen with food. People go, people go out to eat. an experienced designer. So there's yeah, they, they, go, they go out to eat to try to escape the trials and tribulations of home and, and life. They want to go, they don't want to be annoyed when they go out to eat. Now I've met plenty of annoying customers, but when they go out to eat, they're, they're like little kindergarten kids. You know, they, they do have high expectations. You know, they can, they can fuss over the coffee not arriving fast or I was ready for my second martini, but there's so much more underneath that. They really, I think people go out to eat to be pampered and that's what their egos are hoping for. So when someone's got that skill of not being resentful to that, but that when they come into that world of service, yeah, the world of service, then it's like, thank you for uh, coming here tonight. How might, you know, when I was, I was helping a friend of mine and I was her front end manager. And when the waitress or the waiter was having a problem, I would go over to the table and I would say, this is going to be a win-win situation. I want to hear what needs to be done to make this an incredibly pleasant experience for you. And if it is within my power, that's going to happen. And I know that you'll be reasonable, but I'm here on a win-win basis. Now talk to me. It just took the fire and the anger and the la la la. But sometimes people just need to be heard, you know, because they're going through a bad marriage or somebody just came up with a cancer diagnosis. And I'm telling you, they're like little brats when they go out. It's just like, you know, it's got to be all about them. So when I came at them with like almost like a shaman healer or, you know, the, the Buddha that was there to say, please let me take away your disdain. You know, when I came to them, like I wasn't trying to overpower them or bully them or, you know, it's all going to be up to me in the end anyway. It was that approach of coming in with loving kindness. But believe me, I, su- I don't suffer fools easily. You know, like I wasn't, I wasn't the girl that was going to let them eat the whole steak and say, I didn't like it and I think I should get it for free. <laughs> well, you nailed Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I just hope I helped Brian. I just hope I, I help, you know, with, with – because he's, he's, he's a guy that's pretty much in control of how the direction is going to go. He knows how to lay down a roadmap of life. He knows how to do it. And he enjoys it. He enjoys it. He's like an architect. He's like the, he the architect, ar- alchemist. Yeah, he like built it. He likes a good foundation. Then he but then I'm, he flies I'm, I'm, free. I'm literally an architect. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> and an experienced designer, and all those. Oh, things. Oh wow. Okay. Is, I just kept hearing that his alchemy skill is he he builds it from. He knows the foundation has to be secure. He knows he has the vision, and he also knows he has to have the vision to have the right type of specialist if you will, do the building and all that. But he's the one that says, here's the grand design. Now, show me, show me what's the priority in your budget. You know, what's the priority? Here's the, here's the vision. What are you willing to invest your, your energies into? Because our first investment is our energies. You know, no matter how much money we have, if we run around and exhaust ourselves, you know, money can't always buy you wellness. We all know that. Mm-hmm. Well, I love that it all started when we got married. So there's that. Absolutely. Well, I just kept seeing that. It was like, and I want you both to um, maybe at your leisure as we come into this full moon in Aquarius, you know, Venus is going to kiss the sun. Then we're coming to the full moon in Aquarius. And that Aquarius full moon is going to clash with, with some of this Leo and Aquarius is, is where Leo is homage to bravery and courage and the brave heart, you know, and it's like in the lion, Witch in the wardrobe, it's Aslan, you know, the, the medicine lion. But when we come to an Aquarian moon, what the Aquarian moon is saying to us is I have to be unique. I have to be different. How might I 
step outside the box and how might I just blast out of here? You know, it's, it's, it's exploring space, you know, it's, it's how do I rise up and, and have faith and trust in the unexpected surprise. You know, it's that surprise factor where Leo's bold enough to confront anything. Aquarius is like, well, let's just, let's not just step outside the box. Let's, let's fly out into the stars. You know, it's like tonight, you know, the Perseids meteor shower for the next couple of nights and, and there's going to be up to 59 to 60 per hour. So this mystic is going to go outside with Venus getting ready to, to kiss the face of the sun and go to the heart of the sun by the 14th. Yeah, you betcha. I'm going to be outside saying, greeting the moon and allowing the star shine to encode me. It's one thing to sing with, with Soma and sound language and chants and meditations and drums at the ceremonial fire and another to actually take my physical geographical earth temple body outside and be and make the dedicated effort after midnight and before dawn to be out there until the stars start streaming in front of my eyes out of the northeast. So it's Sirius and it's Leo and it's the Perseids meteor shower and so if the skies are cloudy at first then just go back in find a window if you don't want to stay out there and start watching with all your light pollution off until you start to see the stars because at 59 to 60 per hour you'll find the right hour because we will be encoded i know i will because that's my real home remember <laughs> mm, coding i like it <laughs> it is it is oh yeah i mean it's you know science used to poo poo and woo woo all that kind of stuff i remember in school it's like there is no water on Mars. Mars is just a gaseous hot, and then they say, oh yeah, there's evidence of water, and oh, there's water on the moon, and it's just like, why don't I just take that science book and throw it? But I used <laughs> to have to, you know, get A's and B's on, so my engineer father would be okay with it at NASA and Oak Ridge, you know, so it's like, we're always upgrading our knowledge because of vision quest and discovery, and every generation goes with what they've got, you know, you just go with what you've got, but you can't become, I don't think it's healthy, to become so stagnant and no, there's no water on Mars. I, I've not been to Mars. I don't know. Maybe there is. I can shift. I can move. I can change. And I'm not necessarily going to take the government's or somebody else's opinion about it. See, it's back to Brian's point. I'm okay with being somewhat of a skeptic. I think it's healthy instead of being a sheeple mm. or being led by addiction and fear porn or, or electronic leashes. You know, like I said to people, you're drunk on your phone. It's just like you got to have... <laughs> You know, 18 beers every night. That phone is like your 18 beers. You're addicted to it. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Well, let me see how long you put it down. Come on, let's go out for a conversation without any phones. Oh, I, I know some people who are addicted to their phones, definitely. Oh, well, Lisa, do you, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Oh, I, you know, I, I feel the same way Brian does as far as not really wanting anything specific. Mm -hmm. I know that there are infinite possibilities and timeline absolutely absolutely and, and all that well, so you know tell i me the, tell me the month of your just tell me the month of your birth june okay with you what spirit says to me is that if we go back to like what i was talking about with brian and brian identified with the seeds the seeding of the garden with you i see blossoms of your love and i feel like that you're like you know in herbology and in, in holistic studies there's a big difference between the healing that can come from a tincture or an elderberry uh, versus uh, tree essences, the Bach flower remedies, you're like that, that high vibration of, of the essence of flowers. And so when you study the essence of flowers, like there's a, there's a very high vibration of the blossom of a mimosa tree. And the Japanese revere it as the tree of immortality. And I see that with you. I see like the mimosa blossom. It only happens in June in this region. And it's indigenous to Japan and the Appalachian Mountains here. And the mimosa tree, when they bloom in June, savvy herbalists go out there and get a few blossoms. And I put them in a glass jar because then in the, in the heavy times of winter, so late January, February, early March, I take out that little jar of those frozen, delicate mimosa blossoms and I pour a little of my favorite tea, you know, over that little blossom. And that blossom is what's going to end up being a seed pod. So it's known to be an elixir. There's Ayurvedic, there's Chinese medicine, and then there's flower essences. A lot of people have used rescue remedy for their animals or to, to take care of fight or flight 
uh, trauma. Well, certain flower blocks, you're like that. You're like the high vibration and delicacy, yet powerfulness of flower blossoms versus sublingual B12 or taking valerian or St. John's wort. This, well, St. John's wort is a flower. But there's something to do with, although you have a delicate constitution energetically, when you tune in and you find that vibratory string and you play it, it's almost as if it reverberates in people, even if it's done. And here's, here's the interesting part. Even if you're doing it in absent healing or you're sending the healing to the person across miles, you know, like you don't have to be in front of a client or in front of a person to do it. It's like you take them into a type of a energetic cocoon and you are in a type of dynamic energy exchange without draining yourself. And I see work, you working with, have you ever studied flowers? Have you worked with the meanings of flowers? No. I think that's a, an, a, an interesting step for you to take. That's the second time plant stuff's come up for you, Lisa. Yeah, I, I channeled light language and I was asking, just doing a channeling for myself and, and plants came up and they were like, oh, she'll know what I mean, plants. I'm like, yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Well, when you get when you get into there's different aspects of of holism too, and and holistic really is people will say stuff all the time like you know uh, it, they say it body mind spirit and I had a, a a native elder say to me there's this new marketing thing that's going he said it in the 90s to me when I was out west he goes this is new marketing thing going on in the woo woo new age movement of you know body mind spirit body mind spirit he goes it's wrong. And I said, oh, okay, you said that with a fierceness. He said, it's always spirit first. It's spirit and how spirit is either infecting or affecting, how it's affecting the mind. And then the mind either pollutes or enhances the body temple. And I said, that makes perfect logic sense to me. So plants, I believe that, and I'm not taking anything away from whether it's plants that are vegetables or or, you know, uh, dandelion greens. I mean, but see, a dandelion, for example, has a yellow flower, as well as you can eat the root, make a tea out of that, and you can also eat the leaves. So for me, for some reason, what I'm seeing intuitively is that it's the energy signature of the flowers that are calling to you right now. I'd investigate it, not because I say so, just to see what how it dovetails in with light language. Yeah, and I've always had a sense for what, heals the body like I'm very very in tune with my body and even with other people just saying well if you you know try that that might work sort of thing well so. given that you're born in June I would if you've never planted night flowers if you've never planted they're in the morning glory family but if you've anybody that's got the sign of cancer moon child in their chart I say go go plant some moon flowers because there's these incredible white flowers and they open at night hmm. they open at night and then they vine and they twist and they've got the heart-shaped leaves just like morning glories do mm -hmm. but they bloom at night and they close up during the day and you walk outside and oh my god the essence Sounds of that great. and that oh, oh they're incredible they're huge they're much bigger than the, the morning glory blossoms but i plant i plant them together every year i plant and i've got a moon child plant it's my chart i plant the grandpa ot which is an Appalachian favorite. That's a real deep violet color of a morning glory. And one's called blue heaven. And that's kind of like a periwinkle blue. So I plant those. And then right in the middle of those, I plant the moonflowers on just a piece of lattice. And they all come out in the morning glories, open up until the hot part of the day. And when the moonflowers, and they all vine together. And there's just, I'm telling you, it's like one year, I think it was 2015, I went out there and it had totally come all over the wall and everything. And the vine then came back down and just, it literally looked like a waterfall of flowers. And I went out to it and I snapped a picture of it and I put it on Facebook and I said, I went and had a conversation with the vine today. And it got like most liked picture for like <laughs> two years in a row because you could feel the vibrational energy of this. I mean, it took its own course, you know, it, 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 you know, only anchored on the lattice and it came right on down into the river rocks down in the gravels it, and then it rooted in the gravels and it went all the way down the steps. There's, there's something truly otherworldly when you find the flower that engages your olfactory sense, that sense of smell, you know, or, or captures you visually. 
Like okay, it really captures you. I'll plant some. Yeah, and then like for Leo, the, the flower for Leo is the dandelion and the sunflower. And they're both very vibrant yellows. So what I like to do with auric healing and color healing is I like to also work with trying to wear some of the colors externally. Like for a guy, his, his, you know, his play clothes or a tie or a breeze that color when I go out. Like right now, I've, I've deliberately went out and bought something in that sunflower yellow so I could feel that color on me. You know, and I, and I notice the, the sunflowers and I'll notice the dandelions and I let my eye fall upon those bright yellow mums. You know, I like looking at those, that yellow right now because it's the flower of the sun. So when we go into Virgo, then you'll come more into the, the healing herbs. You know, Virgo will be like the rosemary and lavender and the healing herbs because Virgo is all about plant healing, you know, the, the medicinal qualities of plants and the essential oils. So when you, and that's another thing you can do, Lisa, you can go in and to some type of herbal shop that has those little testers of all the oils and you can go for the flower ones. Like how do you feel when you smell geranium? How do you feel when you're smelling helichrysum, you know, or the different flowers, jasmine, are you drawn to them? Are you more drawn to citrus or the woodsy, you know, like are you drawn to, uh, like eucalyptus or frankincense, the ones that are more of the air element, and start getting in touch with, you know, what's what's my smell sense, what's my olfactory sense talking to me about in 2019? I, there's a reason why we're, oh gosh, I don't like musk or ooh, I don't like patchouli or ooh, I don't like jazz and that's just too strong for me. And then you say to yourself, oh my God, I'm so drawn to that rosemary and that geranium. Yeah, okay, then go look it up. Go look up the healing benefits and the healing qualities of geranium and rosemary. Or why are you so drawn to lemon? You know, why are you so drawn to that? See, I love lilacs. Okay, okay, and, and the, lilacs are one of the gentle flowers. Pear tree. What is that tree we always smell when we go to Telluride and our tree right outside? It's a, it's a Japanese lilac. Japanese lilac. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. There's uh, yeah. There's even a. There's one that looks like these. I swear they look like these Buddha, like kind of Buddha lotus blossoms and i think it's in the magnolia family except they're like double colors of pink there's like a magenta and a pink and i always call it the tulip tree here in tennessee but it's got a fancy ass name but when that thing blooms it looks like oh look buddha's been bloom and it always like starts blooming at the buddha full moon in scorpio every year and it's just like it, at the Wiesack festival and that's one of the trees i like here but you study you later on you because it came up by the providence of spirit so it was intuitive you study the the healing Benefits and effects of the mimosa blossom, the mimosa tree. You look that one up. Okay, well, awesome. Well, thank you. Um, so, uh, Mary, we've got a question from our audience. Uh, okay. She wants to remain anonymous, but she's from the LA area. Okay. She's wondering if you have any insight into her missing memories and time and if it's related to her health issues. Being related to her health and wellness challenges and issues and accomplishments i'm going to reframe that because it's not just an illness and a challenge and i i when i feel like there was something that was what's what my guides are saying to me there was something buried in the unconscious of this lifetime that had to do with something that was of shock and awe shock and awe so it's like if i sneak up on a cat and it's sound asleep and it really just wants to sleep in the corner i'm going to surprise it shock it and frighten it okay then if the cat either scratches me or runs away, but there's still been a little bit of distrust that's been formed between me and that cat if I keep doing that. So I feel like when she was in an innocent stage, age in her life, that she's got some missing memories and some missing time. Because And this can happen sometimes when people are in a sudden car wreck. They're the kid in the back seat and their parents were driving and it was somebody else's actions that prompted the car to go off the bridge in the rain or whatever but it still goes into the cellular effect of the child that it was shock and awe and it's not that the child grows up blaming the parents but there's a certain distrust from a child's standpoint of dad drives too fast in the rain or i don't i don't like dad's driving and so there's something that begins to anchor into the memory banks and then there starts to be missing memory and missing information and as we grow into teenage and adulthood we sort of lose our ability to connect the dots and and uh, understand what the strings on the mandala 
or the Dreamweaver are going back to a certain point in time where there was something shocking, surprising, out of the ordinary. And that ends up being, in a greater or lesser degree, a type of trauma that goes in. So I feel with her, Anonymous LA, that part of the medicine for her is to find someone that's really good at doing, um, teaching her, working with self-hypnosis. She can find that on YouTube. You know, I mean, for what we pay for the price of the internet these days. I would suggest she listen to some of, uh, one of the guys I trained with, Dr. Brian Weiss. And he's got some past life type of meditations. And what I liked about studying with Brian Weiss, who's a degreed psychiatrist, is that when I took training with him in person, what I loved about him was, look, I may write books and I may teach you about past lives, but when you do a 20-minute session of a past life, he said, don't be so, like Brian, like your Brian would say, don't be so addicted to the fact that I'm going back to a past life. You're not going to get back to a former walkabout or a past life without dealing with the trauma of this lifetime, without clearing any kind of, of roadblocks that you've got to do with the lifetime that you're dealing with at the moment. Because whether past lives are true or not, whether reincarnation is true or not, if you don't believe in reincarnation, then this is the life that really matters. Yeah? Okay, if you do believe in reincarnation, then this is the life that really matters. It's the same. It's the same. Mm -hmm. So I feel with her that if she would, and again, through YouTube, there's a, another great gal on YouTube, Kelly Howell, that does the secret universal mind meditation. And she says that it takes usually to lay down a valuable new improved neural pathways that it could take anywhere from 25 to 30 days, just falling asleep with the meditation. It's like 30 minutes. She has an incredible voice quality and you just go to sleep with that. And she's cleansing you and she's prompting your wellness and all of those things. And, and for anonymous LA, she needs to hear these meditations in full consciousness first. So she doesn't have any kind of doubt or insecurity. Like the first time you hear something that's going to be involving hypnosis, be fully awake and listen to it and see if you have any concerns. If you don't, then you'll go deep into hypnosis with it because you've already heard it and your eyes were open and you didn't allow yourself to go into deep hypnosis. And so therefore the medicine, the healing is on deep internal levels. And that's what I feel she needs. And okay. you know, the old saying, you know, the old saying when the student is ready, the right teacher appears nowadays that can be found on YouTube. She may not have to actually go to somebody. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, that, that is that's for a sure. blessing of our time. You know, that's yeah. a blessing of our generation. And, I, and those, there are blessings to the technology and the smartphones and the avenues that we have. I just think it's a mistake to get addicted to it and leashed by it. All right. Well, that's great. Um, I'm sure she'll appreciate that. Uh, we also have one more question from Lucia in Romania. Okay. She's um, wanting to leave her country to go to another country where she believes there's opportunities. Um, she's just wondering if you have any um, insight into uh, anything that may happen over the next six months or so regarding this. Uh, for some reason, I felt Italy. When you're asking me the question, when she was want wanting to leave her country, most people by assumption would say, oh, she's wanting to get to America. I don't see that with her. I see like Italy, Spain, there's something in that, in that region there. Um, that I feel is going to be very fortunate for her. And I feel like that as I see it, as it's given to me, I feel like that that's going to be a very important walkabout vision quest for her. And the second thing that came up was Australia. That's the second thing. She's going to really change <laughs> the landscape of where she comes from. I mean, it's going to be a big change, but I don't feel like the first relocation that she does just to follow that example. I mean, I, I feel like even if she goes to Italy and Spain, there'll be some wonderful fated kismet connections. And I feel like within five to four to five years, she'll be relocating again to somewhere else in a joyous way. Not, in, not because there was any kind of disappointment that happened in Italy or Spain, Italy's the strongest, but that the, the, the adventure continues. But yeah, she is going to leave Romania. It's better for her to do that. It's like she landed there She's experienced most of what she needs to experience there now, and she's branching out. Hmm. Great. Well, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. It comes fast with me. It just, 
you know, I just, when somebody asks a question, it's just, I give them whatever is given to me. Oh, well, that's great. And I know um, just before we close up the show, Mary, um, we didn't really talk too much about Jupiter finally going direct. Is there any final messages that you wanted to give the audience on what they can expect with Jupiter going direct? It's like our, it's like the, the, there's a great image of, of Lady Fortunata. You know, Jupiter is Zeus in Greek mythology and Zeus was the hotshot deity that told Mercury go over here and Mars go over there and sit down and talk with me. Athena over here, and so Zeus was like the main, you know, uh, you know, the, in the pantheon, it was he was the big deal. So Jupiter expands, Saturn constricts, Jupiter expands. So a lot of people right now that are under the sign of Sagittarius or Gemini, or they have a Moon or rising sign in that, they'll have to watch expanding their taste for sweets or alcohol because alcohol converts to sugar. They may find that they're partaking of ayahuasca or DMT or pot a little too much because Jupiter's like, I want more. Why not? Or they may find that they got lucky at the casino, but their addiction to go to the casino and play the slots might be too much, you know? So the, the caveat with the most beneficial planetary agent in astrology is that Jupiter's like, I want more, I want more, 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 more. And you can only eat so much fudge cake before you start saying, okay, that's a little much. <laughs> I mean, there will be reactions to that action. So Jupiter and Sagittarius, I, I like Jupiter and its home sign of Sagittarius, but it's about vision quest. It's an excellent time from now to the close of the year. It's an excellent time. Um, there's a little bit of a bump and a grind around August the 28th that says, don't overdo it. Don't push your point. Don't be a bully philosophically you're not you don't have to always be right you don't have to always get the applause when there's a clash there because we're also going to start to have um as mercury's in leo it's going to come up and it's going to square uranus and taurus so right around that that time frame the 27th 28th of august jupiter's kind of on back burner but overall jupiter is saying to us i'm direct so what lights up your heart what lights up your heart because whatever lights up your heart philosophically, the type of food you're eating, the, 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 the spirit of play that you're engaging. Sagittarius is about enjoying the journey, enjoying the vision quest pursuit. It's not about what you'll obtain. It's the enjoyment of the journey. So I, I have to finish up the show by saying right now with Leo and Jupiter and the Virgo stellium coming up, what's lighting up your heart? How's your heart lighting up? If your heart's lighting up, that's where you belong. That's your space. That's your place. If it's lighting up your heart, if it's not disengage quickly as you can. Mm. That good is great. Advice. Yeah. Very good advice. <laughs> Truly. Well, well, Mary, where can our audience, I, um, if they want to reach out to you or book the reading, do you do personal readings and, and all I do that? telephone readings. Yep. I do telephone. I had an office years ago in Florida and now, and you know, I, I realized even in my office, Lisa and Nicole and Brian, I was closing my eyes when people were across the desk from me because I don't read body language because like Brian, I have that skeptic side of me. So I want people to say, Oh, well, she's asking questions or she's reading body language. I didn't ask them crap. I just gave them what I gave them and it was up to their job to assimilate the data. You know, I'm just the spiritual satellite. So I love doing telephone consultations because I'm reading their frequencies. I don't need to see them in person. And I do astrological charts and I do, it, it's multifaceted. It's not just tarot. It's not just astrology. It's about really going into that inner aspect of them and helping them get untwisted. You know, I, I do self-hypnosis. I take them on shamanic journeys, but I found that a telepath can work very well on the telephone. So they can go to my website. It's just simply marydecina.com on Facebook. It's Cosmic Conditions. And then, of course, every new moon, I'm with our lovely host, Joe Roop, on Lighting the Void. And the next one will be the late night on my time zone. It'll be at midnight on August the 29th, talking all about the Virgo energy signatures into the, of course, August 30th, because I start on my time zone at midnight. 
And it goes, yeah, you guessed it, till 3 a.m. Am I dedicated or what? Wow. Well, that's, your, yeah. that's your time to shine, though, that, that time of night. <laughs> I know. I know. It's, it's true. It's a good thing I was born at night, girl. That's all I can say. <laughs> well, thanks so much for being on the show. We really appreciate you having here and giving. I appreciate all of you and all the work you do to help the souls on the earth that are troubled and seeking. Again, we all toast our glasses to this little afternoon of a cosmic cocktail hour. Yes, it was wonderful. And thank you to our audience for joining us again. We will all be back with you next week. Bye. Thank you all for joining our show. We appreciate you tuning in and supporting us. If any of you have any questions you would like answered on the show or any guests that you would like to hear on our show, please email that information to us at info at enlightenup.us or send us a voice message using the Anchor app. There's a super cool feature on there that allows you to send us a message or ask us a question with a touch of a button right from the app. And please continue to support us by following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And if you haven't checked out Nicole's channel on YouTube yet, head on over there for some more insight from her, or you can visit her website, inflexibleme.com, where you can book a personal coaching session or a tarot reading, watch some of her most informative videos, or you can sign up for her newsletter. And if you're interested in some light language healing, head to my YouTube channel, Lisa Loves Love, or send me an email to lisa at lisaloveslove.com to inquire about your own personal reading. Thank you again for joining us and supporting us, and we'll be back with you all next week.